Welcome to a detailed review of Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game from Steamforge Games, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this video game based board game. Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, was designed by Sherwin Matthews and features art from the Gorilla Miniature Games Art Department, Thomas Lishman, and Doug Telfer. It was published in 2020 after a very successful Kickstarter. This board game version of Horizon Zero Dawn plays one to four players. A full game consists of five hunts, each of which takes an hour or two. The game is appropriate for players 12 and up and is rather heavy with lots of little fiddly rules. Now, Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, focuses on one aspect of the video game, the Hunter's Lodge. Here you take on the role of a hunter heading out on a quest. You and your fellow hunters will be competing to see who can earn the most glory through a series of five hunts, culminating in the Hunter's Call, where you'll try to take down your prey. In this base game, that prey is the legendary Sawtooth. Along the way, you'll earn Sons for Glory, level up your hunters, meet merchants, and improve your equipment. In the end, the hunter with the most sons will be named the first among equals. That is, if you survive. Now for a look at the fantastic miniatures and other stuff you get, check out our Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game unboxing video on YouTube. Now here you'll see everything you get, including some really top-notch miniatures. Thick double-sided modular boards, a wide variety of counters and tokens, and tons of cards. Now these cards include a deck for each of the four hunters, large machine information cards, machine behavior cards, Merchant decks, a deck of salvage cards, an event deck, and a tracking deck. There's also a rather thick rulebook and eight custom dice, all tucked into a plastic insert. Now, while this insert was great for getting the game into our hands in good shape, mm -hmm. it's not great for organizing all the stump stuff once you have played. No, unfortunately not. Now, one thing component-wise of note is just how small the Hunter miniatures are. Now, I understand this was done to be able to keep everything in scale so the monsters were appropriately sized. Sorry, the machines, machine monsters. I, I get it. If you'd made them standard, you know, 32 millimeter scale or your standard heroic scale miniatures, the sawtooth probably wouldn't have fit in the box. So I do understand it, but you're not going to be able to get these miniatures and say use them with your other D&D or Warhammer miniatures in RPGs or games. They're pretty much sized specifically for this board game. So what are we doing with these small minis and other components? Let's move on to an overview of play. So step one in playing Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, is to pick what you want to hunt. The thing is, this box only comes with one hunt, one option. There are a ton more hunts unlocked during the Kickstarter, but with just this box, you will be working to complete the same hunt every time you play, and that's a hunt for the Sawtooth. Next, each player picks a hunter. There are four of these in the box, representing familiar cultures from the video game series. Grab all the stuff for this hunter, like the minis, card deck, and skill token. Sort your action deck, finding all of the zero-level cards, and place your starting cards on the table, including your hunter ability, initial weapons, armor, and starting resource. Next, you enter the tracking phase, where the leader, who is the oldest or most experienced player for the first hunt, draws the top three cards of the encounter deck, and picks which encounter the group will have first. I think more games need the start player to be the person who knows the game best. I do appreciate that. Not just as a rule teacher. Now, the board is set up. Like, the, the playing board is set up based on the card that was chosen. It's made up of two to four of the game boards, each of which is going to be on a side based on the player count. You're then going to seed that with machines as well as other scenery tokens. Players then place their hunters onto the edge of the starting board. Now, at this point, it's time for the first actual hunt, which is played through in what they call the encounter phase. You'll be playing through five of these, including the hunter's call, which is the final battle versus your chosen adversary. One note, when you're laying out the boards, do pay careful attention to their orientation mm -hmm. on the table. This makes a huge difference, as well as the player count on each side of the board. Yes, note the boards say 2A. 2A is the same board as the other side. There is not, I assumed the first time we played that 2A was one side and 2B would be the other side of the same board, and it's not. So we messed up our player count during our first experience with this game. Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, is a busy game with a lot going on and lots mm -hmm. of variables and things to track. Due to this, what follows will only 
be a vague overview of how the game plays without getting into the actual details. This isn't meant to be a how to play, but rather give you and your group a good idea of how things play out so you can make your own decision on whether or not to dive deeper. So each turn of an encounter has a number of phases, which starts with the active character taking two actions. These actions include sprinting, which lets you move two squares, but alerts all past machines along your path. Sneaking, which lets you move only one square, but doesn't alert adjacent machines. Craft, which lets you cycle your discards back into your deck and acts as a form of healing. Distract, which lets you toss a rock and move a machine. And finally, making an attack, of which there are two types, ranged and melee. Attacks are made by rolling the custom dice and looking for hit symbols with various boosts being added by action cards from the player's hands. These can give more dice, give re-rolls, allow for additional actions. There is also a critical hit symbol on some of the dice, which will trigger special effects on your equipment or cards. Mm -hmm. Similar to the video game, attacks can cause various elemental effects like fire, ice, and shock damage. There are also rules for trap weapons and area of effect attacks. Now, when attacking most machines, you have a choice. You can either try to take out the machine itself or try to knock off components, something you'll be very familiar with two players of the video game. Both give glory, but removing components can make machines easier to defeat and or give you access to additional scrap. Now, after the active hunter takes their two actions, it's time for those machines to go. Machines start off non-alert and stay that way until they get attacked, they take damage from some other source, an alert enemy is in their square, a hunter is in their square, a hunter is in an adjacent square that doesn't contain tall grass, or a hunter sprints by them. Non-alert enemies follow the paths laid out on the board. If these paths lead them off the map, that machine is considered to have escaped. Alert enemies instead follow what it says on their behavior cards. Now, each behavior card features a branching path of actions that the active machine will take, and this branching path is often based on set conditions, like is the machine still carrying cargo, or is there a hunter within one square, and so on. Now, while going through the path on the cards, the machines will end up moving about the board, alerting other enemies, and, of course, attacking your hunters. Now, when a machine attacks, there's no dice rolled for the machine. It just does a set amount of damage, but this damage can be mitigated by a defense roll. This, the player rolls using dice based on the armor they're wearing. Now, as part of defending, the hunter also must dodge to a new square. Now, I'm calling this out because we completely forgot this rule, not only the first time we played, but most often while playing the game, often forgot to move that dodge. When a hunter is damaged, they have to discard cards from their hand and then their deck. If their deck is ever empty, they are knocked out. Knocked out hunters miss a turn, lose any earned glory, and come back with a fully shuffled deck the next round. Now, this isn't too big a penalty, actually. Getting knocked out isn't horrible in this game, but you do have to watch out because if the number of hunters that get knocked out over the entire hunt ever matches the player count of your group, you fail the hunt and get no reward. Now, unless this is the final hunt against the Sawtooth, you do get to continue. You just move on to the next hunt. You don't need to win every hunt to win the game, but you're going to miss out on leveling up and scrap and things you're going to want for that final fight. Now, once all machines go, there is a maintenance step. You determine if you've lost or won the hunt and continue on to the next player's turn if you haven't. Hunts are won by defeating a set number of machines based on the encounter card the leader chose. Once players get to this total, they have the option to continue or to take out any remaining machines in an effort to get some bonus scrap. Now, after an encounter, you enter what's called the campfire phase, which starts with awarding players sun tokens based on the total glory they got in the last hunt, with the most suns going to the player with the most glory, who also gets the leader token. The fledgling token is given to the player who scored the least glory and is a big catch-up mechanic in this game. Next, players level up their hunters if the encounter they just finished is a higher level than they are. Mm -hmm. Every character has a unique talent tree, and players will pick one of the two options at each level. These will include new cards that are added to the hunter's action deck, new permanent abilities, or perhaps new equipment. Now, the last part of the camping step is for everyone to go shopping. 
A set of cards is drawn from the appropriate level merchant deck and players get to spend the scrap they gathered for new equipment, ammo, weapons, and modifiers for their existing gear. The merchant stock refreshes after each purchase, and while the leader gets first pick, the fledgling gets to buy for first item for free. Note that your deck size is limited by your level, so buying more stuff does not give you more health. Now, after camping, it's time to move on to the next hunt. Unless you've reached the hunter's call card, and the fifth and final hunt, the leader, who may be new, draws three encounter cards and picks one. The fledgling then draws three event cards, picks one, and you move on to the next encounter. Now, the final hunt is represented by the hunter's call card, which is face up on the table, taunting you for the entire thing. It features a bigger board with your chosen prey on it. Now, the leader has no choices to make for this encounter. You all have to do the, the hunter's call. But the fledging does get to play an event card, giving them one final advantage in the final fight. Now, this final battle actually plays out the same as any previous battle, with two exceptions. For one, hunters that take down one of the hunted machines, in this case the sawtooth, gets a bonus half sun. Plus, if the hunters fail at this hunt, everyone loses the game. No one wins. Now, assuming your team is able to take down their final prey, they earn suns as in a normal victory step. And then, the player with the most suns is declared the winner. Now, in addition to playing competitively, which is the default way to play Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, you also have a cooperative variant. Now here, players are encouraged to work together and take down the machines together, but if any one hunter is knocked out even once in a single hunt, you lose. Now there's also a variant rule that allows the trading of items between players during the campfire phase that can be used when playing cooperatively or competitively. I think that's a pretty good overview of play. It's time to move on to our thoughts on this licensed board game. So let me start by talking about the license. I am a huge fan of Horizon Zero Dawn, the video game. I don't play a lot of video games. I play them now and then, and I almost never play them when they're the new hotness, and I hardly ever finish a game. Well, I did play Horizon Zero Dawn when it was relatively new. I loved every moment of it, finished the full game, as well as the downloadable content, and 100%ed both. Yes, that included earning all the dang blazing suns. Now, I, on the other hand, never played the game, and knew nothing about it when sitting down to play this board game version. Now, I will say as a fan of the video game, I did have some trepidation about the board game version. But I was curious about it and jumped at the chance to review it, so thanks for the opportunity, Streamforge. Now, I didn't expect much. I was expecting a licensed game that had cool stuff from the video game and probably was okay to play. I was pleased to learn that not only is Horizon Zero Dawn the board game a great representation of at least part of the video game, it's just a very solid, thematic, Ameritrash dice chucking game with lots of player agency and really cool character customization. If you don't have a clue what Horizon Zero Dawn is, that's fine. You're mm -hmm. going to kill things and try not to die. If you're into that sort of game, you can learn about the license as you go, and it won't impact your enjoyment if you don't know in advance. Now, what impressed me the most was the way that the designer decided to make a game out of the video game, and that was by focusing on just one part of Horizon Zero Dawn, which is the Hunter's Lot. This is a brilliant way to let players explore a part of the world without having to live up to the epic nature of the whole open world game and its massive setting. Taking on the role of a small group of hunters about to head out on a hunt to take down one of the game's legendary beasts just fits perfect for a board game theme. If anything, not knowing the ins and outs of the world meant I wasn't distracted and could more easily focus on powers, skills, and tactics. Though knowing a little bit about the behavior of the monsters in the video game would have allowed me to perhaps better anticipate what some of the monsters' AI mechanics would be. Still, that wasn't any real advantage or disadvantage in the long term over the full hunt. Yeah, we'll say those behavior cards that we described while covering the game do have the machines act as you would expect them to act if you played the video game, which is something I never even thought when teaching the game that I might want to point out to the other players who haven't played it. Now, I got to say, by limiting the scope of the game, I think that made it possible for Steam Forge and their development team to kind of nail down the mechanics for this one thing, hunting machines. 
That's what you're focusing on. And that step, so the three steps of tracking phase and counter phase and campfire phase does give you that feel of being part of a hunter party, as well as the interplay between the characters in a party all vying for dominance, which is a big part of the story of the video game and, and people trying to outdo each other. Plus, the epic nature of the quest is further reinforced through the amount of game time it takes to play. Though some might be overwhelmed by just how epically long it can be. Yeah. The time on the box is for one portion of a hunt. The real playtime is five times that length. Yeah. While thematic and feeling epic, this is honestly what I think is going to be the biggest problem with this game for potential game groups. The overall length. Well, the rule book notes you can finish the entire game in one night. I can't see many groups wanting to do that. Each individual encounter phase was taking us an hour or two. Then there's the additional time required to shop, level up, customize your decks, and just get things set up and get the miniatures on the board and sort the tokens and get the encounter deck shuffled. You're looking at, I would say, six to ten hours to complete a full game of Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. That alone is going to scare many game groups away. I honestly think this isn't even made even remotely clear until no. you get going with the game, which is unfortunate as it could sour players on it, even if they were enjoying themselves on that first hunt. Some just might not want to leave a game set up for the time required to finish. Now, I'll admit the first time we sat down, it was the three of our four of us with Tori and Kat. I had no clue. That's what we were signing up for was this massive game. The box said two hours, one to two hours. And if you have first game, I'll double it Four hours. We have a four hour game night. We can easily fit this in. And we only managed to fit in three hunts. And I think we played for about six hours. So, yeah, it's not initially obvious just how long this game is. And unfortunately, there's no real good way to save between hunts. I played many other board games that have this type of gameplay where multiple things have to happen. But there's some kind of save mechanic. Now, yes, you could put the boards and the machines and the various card decks you don't need out because they're going to change for the next time. So you can put those away, but you need to keep track of things like which cards from each action deck players have unlocked. Once you've hit level one, you've added some cards to your deck. Where you are on your skill tree, which branching path did you take? What sc scrap have you gathered? What do you have left? How many suns have you earned? Well, the glory clears at the end. The suns carry over till the final scoring. Now, I will say what I would normally do in this case would just baggies. Every player gets another baggie. You put your your current deck in one baggie. You put your still to earn cards in another baggie. You put your scrap in a baggie and put it all in. But then that box insert, there's no space to, to put separated out components. This insert is designed to store the minis so they don't get damaged. It's not great for sorting everything else in the game. You just basically it wants you to put in your whole stack of cards in one compartment and all your components in another. Now, of course, none of this is a problem if you are lucky enough to have a game space where you can leave the game set up and return to it later. Now, if your group doesn't mind signing up for a potential 10 hour game experience, quite possibly split over multiple nights, there is a lot to like in Horizon Dawn, Zero Dawn, the board game. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I really like is the mixture of thematic dice driven adventure game. With light deck construction. Now, not, not deck building. You're not shuffling through your deck. This is pre-constructed deck before you start each encounter. Now, the system here is kind of like a hybrid of dungeon crawl moves and attacks and taking out the monsters using custom dice and card-driven combat just by how much each of the hunter's action deck can modify play. Now, the biggest one you're going to see right at the beginning of the game is to fire your ranged weapon. You need ammo cards, which combo with your weapon but you don't actually need to use cards on your turn. But we did find out pretty quickly in order to do well on a hunt, it's going to take figuring out the best use of every card in that action deck. When can they be used and actually using them up, even though they're your health. And this is really one of the interesting aspects of the, the semi co-op sort of idea of the game. The customization when buying gear means you can choose to help yourself at the expense of others or mm -hmm. be nice and make sure your whole hunting party has what it needs to bring down the beasts. Now, I also love how asymmetric each hunter is. Though I gotta say, some seem more useful than others in this hunt. Uh, in particular, the Karja Warriors seem to be the most difficult to play well. Though I admit, 
For competitive play, they're awesome at stealing kills out of the nose of other players. Now, further adding to the asymmetry when leveling up, you get to follow a customization tree that allows two different paths. And then that path branches to two different options, and that path branches to two different options. And I love the fact that the next time I play, I could play a Karja Warrior again, and it could feel completely different. Even with this, though, I do wish there were just more hunters in the core box, kind of like I wish there were more monsters. I just would love to see more variety because with the base box, playing four players, you're stuck with the same four characters every time. And the skill tree really does make for some devilishly hard choices. Mm -hmm. You know early on that you're going to have to pick between a growing number of cool abilities and pick a path that eliminates some in order to gain others. Yeah, when you're at the final level, you're only getting one out of three choices, and that, that just feels rough. And I got to say, after I picked my first thing, I looked ahead in my deck, and I was like, oh, I can't possibly get this, and this looks awesome. Now, speaking of variety, I can't help but mention the sawtooth in the room, right? My biggest disappointment with this particular box is the fact you get one hunt. Now, not only that, but this base hunt is for, I don't know, it's a sawtooth. Like, it, it's it's... It's the big first jump scare, the big first scary monster you see in the intro to the game. It's just, it's not that impressive. Yeah, it's kind of neat. You get the first one and the first box comes with the first monster. But if you're playing through Horizon Zero Dawn and you finish the game, a big hunt for a sawtooth just doesn't get my blood, blood pumping. That said, this box did make me want to go pick up expansions so we could hunt other monsters. Frankly, again, as someone not knowing the game, I found the crab-like creatures much more terrifying and concerning, though that might be in part due to the fact that we ran into them before we had powered up as much as when we hit the sawtooths. I, they are intimidating, the shell walkers, and plus they were the, putting that fight out was great because it was a good way to get extra gear. But again, you get that competitive cooperative thing competitively. You want to steal that crate off the back of those before anyone else does. So I did like those. But yeah, I, the crab walkers were definitely... They damaged us way more than that. That, I think, was our hardest encounter of the entire thing was, I think it was a level two encounter with crab walkers or shell walkers. Now, after our last play, even my Euro loving wife was online checking out what else there is to offer. So I got to say, if, if Steam Forge's goal was uh, here's a taste like uh, here, fight a sawtooth, you're going to like this and leave you wanting more. It worked. Now, for me, not knowing what else there is in the Horizon world, like what I might be missing out on, I enjoyed it and I would play it again, but I wasn't eager for more and hungry to see what other beasties you could fight uh, because there is replayability to some degree True. within this uh, within this box. Yeah, and I will say the leader system of picking which uh, which encounter to do, like we used one third of each encounter. Like, I, so there's what, 15 times more? possibilities of what we could have fought that we didn't see so it's not like I'm, I'm not trying to say it's not replayable i just that whole i think part of it is the instruction book says choose a hunt and then goes the only hunt you get is the sawtooth i'm like don't say choose a hunt just say this is a hunt for sawtooth and maybe i'd feel differently about it now another concern worth mentioning and i think we've already kind of covered it is this is a thematic dice chucker and due to that randomness of the dice will be a factor every game while there is a bit of mitigation, this is a highly random Amerith Rash style game. This is especially true during the first couple of encounters because your low level equipment just doesn't build very big dice pools. I, at the most, I think we were rolling three dice at the beginning. You're going to spend a lot of time planning out your attack and trying to do it. No, we're going to make sure we're stealthy so it doesn't get armor just to roll badly and do nothing. This is going to turn some people off, though I have to say, that's what What else did you expect? That's the type of game this is. Now, thankfully, the advancement and shopping system does help overcome some of the randomness. So while you might no longer miss, you might not do enough damage to achieve what it is you wanted. Yeah. You're not usually whiffing away wildly in those later parts, though. That is true. Now, while playing, we did run into a few things as we got further, and you got that leveling up and more equipment that just didn't seem to make sense. Now, one example is a weapon, the included weapons that have a awesome critical hit ability, like just like, oh, plus six damage or does something really cool that uses blue dice. And while the blue dice don't have any critical hit symbols on them, 
And there's literally no way in the box to get those powers to ever go off. I'm like, this makes no sense. So we did some additional research and we learned that there are ammo cards and other cards in the expansions that can add other dice to these weapons, dice that have crit symbols on them, but you're not going to find them in this box. Now, in particular, I noted I played the Karja Warrior. One of their final level skills is a new Karja Spear that because of this is actually worse than the base weapon because it uses blue dice and you'll never get its crit to go off. Yeah, this was uh, this was shocking. The top level upgrade that was, as far as I'm concerned, broken mm -hmm. as it uh, as it required unknowingly a completely separate purchase to make and, and purchase as in financial purchase. Yes, to make what should be a character's top weapon worth owning at all ever. Yeah, and it's not the only one. There was other ones that came up in the merchant decks that I was like, why would you buy this? This doesn't work. And I almost wonder if they changed what were on the dice before the game was published. The, the blue dice at one time had a critical hit symbol on it, and they removed it at some point to go, no, this is a damage only die. Anyway, I, I can't tell you why, but this is a frustration um, with the game. If you back the Kickstarter and went all in and got all the stuff, maybe you never even noticed. But what we're reviewing here is the retail copy that people can buy at their local game store or online. Now, another issue that came up when learning this game was the real rule book, which could use some work. Now, it's OK. It's written in a logical order to sit down on your couch and read through. But it's not great for teaching the game or referencing gameplay. And the biggest issue, and it's one we talked about our what makes for a bad rule book uh, episode, is lots of little tiny rules that are scattered throughout the book in places you wouldn't think to look for them. An example would be status effects. Instead of just having a page that says status effects or a summary of status effects, instead you get to the hunter damage section and there's a whole section on what status effects do to hunters. Then later in the book, when you go into monster effects, you have a list of status effects and what happens to monsters. How are those not in one place? Like there should just be one section that tells you what status effects do to monsters or machines and to, and to the hunters. I just found that, and, and these two sections aren't like it's on one page and you flip the page. It's like a totally different section of the rule book, multiple pages apart. Now, while this made learning the game rough with our first couple of hunts, taking probably double the time they should have, once you do get everything down, the game had a pretty solid flow. With a group of explorer, experienced players, I think you really can get down to an hour and possibly less per encounter. I highly recommend when you're learning the game, have at least one person download the PDF version of the, of the manual, throw it on a tablet or a laptop and use word searches. Yeah. This saves you a lot of page flipping. That is assuming you at least know the game terms well enough. Sometimes there, there were certain terms where I couldn't find them because I, I didn't remember off the top of my head what the game called that thing. Mm hmm. Overall, we found Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game, to be an excellent adaptation of the video game. I love the way it focuses on one part of the series and then makes that part shine. Through the exploration, encounter, and camping system, you really do get a feel of being on a hunt. And the character progression you make as the hunt goes on feels very rewarding. The problem with this, though, is that a full hunt is a long, epic event. Longer than most people are going to want to play through, especially in one night. I think if this had been a four, maybe five hour game from start to finish, I would have been more excited. And perhaps with experience, it might get down to that short a game. But getting that experience is a bit of a crawl. Now, groups also need to look at what type this game this is, what what category it falls into, I guess. It's, this is a thematic dice chucker with strong character optimization options. And before deciding if this game is for you or not, you need to realize this. You also have to be aware that this box is only a taste of what Steamforge has to offer for Horizon Zero Dawn. In this box, you're only getting one hunt and four characters, and there's a good chance you're going to end up wanting more. One other thing we didn't note, but that comes as part of being a semi-co-op, is a potential quarterback issue. That wasn't something we had a problem with, but... If you are discussing tactics, as with most games of that style, it can be an issue. Now, I will say it's alleviated a bit when you are playing competitively, because if someone else is telling you what to do, you need to take into effect 
they may be doing it for their own gain. And I did find for a semi co-op, there was almost no quarterback when we were playing, except for just a couple things at the very end. We we're on the boss fight and we were worried about winning. If anything, the one of the biggest problems or times it comes up is the very start, the your first action of the game, yep. which can make that's true make or break something. <laughs> yeah. No, that is true. Now, for fans of Horizon Zero Dawn, you're going to want to check this game out somehow. If you're a fan of thematic games, if you like dungeon crawlers and dice heavy adventure games, you just go pick this up. It's a, it's a safe buy. Now, if you and your group generally prefer games with less randomness and more player control, I recommend finding a way to try before you buy. If you know nothing about Horizon Zero Dawn like me, there's still a lot to like in this game. I knew nothing about it or its setting and was easily able to jump in as the theme of a pack of hunters trying to take down a legendary beast is pretty universal. Now, if you're more into the Euro side of gaming and prefer games like Gloomhaven, say over Descent, this is probably not the game for you. That said, my wife is the big Euro gamer in our group, and she ended up enjoying the game way more than expected. Though do note, she is a big fan of the video game series. For me, I personally can't wait until we've got another weekend and we can dedicate to trying out the Stormbird expansion and seeing just how much swapping up the hunt actually does change the game. Well, that's it for our review of Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. Have thoughts on Horizon Zero Dawn, the original digital game, or this one? Why not join our Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com and start up a conversation. For a somewhat more detailed look at this board game version of Horizon Zero Dawn and lots of pictures from our gameplays, I do invite you to check out my written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. 